So I've been on a journey of learning about healing, praying for healing for most of my life. I was blessed to be brought up in a Christian home uh, and the kind of home where when you said you were sick as well as getting you medicine, the, the offer of prayer was just there instantly, which is a real blessing. Um, as I was thinking about our series, one story that I'd almost forgotten came back to mind to me that I want to begin with today. Um, I remember early on in this journey of learning to pray for other people uh, to be healed. I was a, a youth leader at a youth conference uh, that ran every year in Scotland, and it was teenagers from all over the nation would come together for this conference. And uh, we had early on in the conference, it was a week-long thing, we had a, a time of ministry and we said, come forward if you need prayer for healing. And so we're all ministry team ready to pray. Uh, and a, a young boy comes up to me, he must have been 11 or 12, around that kind of age range. And he was having real problems with his knee. And it was in pain. He couldn't quite run around like he wanted to. And so I prayed my best prayer and absolutely nothing. And in that moment, it would have been the easiest thing in the world to go, sorry, it didn't work this time. Bye. But actually what happened in that moment is something rose up in me and said that was like, no, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. So I, say, I said to the boy, can I pray again? So we prayed again, nothing. I wasn't okay with that though. So I said to him, I said, I'm here all week. I want you to come up as many times as you want. Come find me, I'm gonna pray for you. Every time, if you do it every half hour, that's fine, I'll do it every half hour. As many times as you come to me for prayer, I will pray for you. So each day goes past, we're praying, we're praying, uh, and I'm in dialogue with the Lord throughout the week, like, God, what's going on? Why is, this, why is this not happening? Until we get to the, I think it was the last day, he comes up to me, I pray, and all the pain disappears from his knee. The guy can run around and play. And yeah, it's, it's, it's good. We can celebrate that. We can, it's okay to celebrate God doing things. And it was amazing. The boy was emotional. I think I was probably more emotional. But the, the, the Lord spoke to me through that because he was giving me a parable about praying for healing. And sometimes it's about faithfulness. Sometimes it's about having a bigger heart for the person in front of you than, than, than you normally do. It's like about saying, yes, we're going after this. Today we continue on in our, our, our looking at Mark's gospel. Joe last week looked at the man with a skin condition uh, that was healed. And last week we were left with those words of Jesus ringing where he says, I am willing. And the question then that Joe posed to us is, are we willing? Are we willing to go on a journey of learning what it is to, to see healing? So today the plan is we're going to read our next passage which follows on straight after uh, Joe's I'm going to walk us through a few key aspects from the passage and then pull out some thoughts for us for today. So we're in Mark chapter 2, and it will be up on the screen here for us. Starting at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, Jesus, to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Okay, we're going to walk our way through, so Phil, you might need to go back to the first part of that passage. But first one, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. 
So this is Jesus' homecoming. Uh, we see in Mark's gospel that Jesus kind of goes between being in the wilderness, being alone, and being back in the city. He kind of alternates uh, in having time alone with God and coming back into the city, a rhythm that we all need in our lives. But for Jesus, there's another reason for this movement. So uh, in the last story that Joe talked about last week, uh, he, Jesus says to the man, tell no one, and what does he do? He tells everyone. And so it's becoming harder for Jesus to be anywhere. And, and, but then Jesus comes home to Cap Capernaum. So this is where Simon Peter and his wife stayed, where John and Andrew lived. And it's even probable that Jesus had a home in Capernaum. So he gets home for a couple of days and news spreads. Verse two, they gathered in such large numbers there was no room left. So the house is absolutely mobbed. At homes of that time, there would have been like one big open space, maybe 18 foot in length. So maybe 50 people squashed into the house and then all these other people leaning in the door, leaning in the window, trying to see. And it says Jesus was teaching him them the word. The word probably means what Mark calls uh, Jesus' kind of mission statement, that the kingdom of heaven is near, repent and believe. That's probably what he's talking to them about. So these men come, uh, four men carrying a paralyzed man. Uh, and to their frustration, the place is packed out. There's no way they're going to get through to Jesus. So they head to the roof. And the roof in homes of their time was used for all sorts of things. They would have been flat roofs. Uh, they would have had a little kind of wall around the edges to prevent anyone falling off. And maybe a shade over the top so that if they were working in the midday sun, they had some shelter. There would have been stairs up the side of the house, up to the roof, so it wasn't like they had to go into the house to get up to the roof. They would have just come around the side and gone up the stairs, which is very simple unless you're carrying a paralyzed man. So the men see an opportunity, they take him up to the roof and they begin digging. How are we gonna get Jesus down? How are we gonna get him down to Jesus? Uh, so their roofs would have been made by like these beams that would have spanned across it. They would have then had branches and then it would have been mud and straw mixed together. So that's why they can dig. It's kind of, it's a little bit different than if you showed up on my house roof uh, and tried to kind of peel the tiles off. I might have a thing or two to say. And I'm reliably told they would actually replace their roofs every few years. So it wasn't quite as dramatic as you uh, taking my roof apart in case you get any ideas. But I want to take a moment and just imagine this scene. Imagine the disruption below. Jesus is in the room, there's all these people crowded in and then dust and straw and mud starts falling on you and it's like, oh, it's in your eyes and you're, you're trying to listen to what Jesus is saying and I just imagine Jesus almost just stopping and just watching. As, as the light kind of appears through uh, the top. Just uh, absolutely bizarre. There was no escape. You were so packed in, there was no running away at this point. And it would have been really obvious that this was a paralyzed man with his mat. And then they, they lower him down. In verse five, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? Well, it maybe was the paralyzed man, but probably more specifically the friends, the four friends who have carried this man, lifted him up the stairs, spent the time digging at a roof and then lowering him down. For Jesus, this desperation is a sign of their faith, this pursuit. He recognized their faith. Jesus' faith radar was, was pinging. These men believed Jesus could change everything for their friend. And elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus comments on people's faith too. And so his response, he's saying to them, is faith that has moved me here. And first we see his warmth to the afflicted man. He says, son, son, your sins are forgiven. Or Matthew says, take heart, son, when he records the same story. Or Luke says, friend. But it's all about just Jesus' compassion for this man. His sins forgiven are forgiven seems like a really odd phrase to us, though, except that within the Old Testament and within the Jewish context he was speaking, the connection between sin and healing would have been much clearer. The Old Testament connects these two ideas in lots of different places. One of them, Psalm 41, uh, verse 4, I said, have mercy on me, Lord, heal me, for I have sinned against you. Psalm 103 that Joe uh, earlier talked about, healing and forgiveness of sins are in, in that one as well. So in their minds, 
this man could not be healed unless his sins had been forgiven. And elsewhere in the Gospels, people take this idea, this connection too far. They go searching for the particular sin that somebody's done that's made them sick. Jesus doesn't do that ever. Though he does affirm the idea that sin and sickness are, that that sickness is ultimately the result of sin. Jesus doesn't ever call out anyone's sin and specifically say, that's why you're sick. So as a general rule, I would suggest we avoid that approach. Making a sick person feel worse is the opposite of healing ministry. So we need to be like Jesus and come to sick people with compassion, not with self-righteousness. However, there is a bigger point going on here. In the same way that death came into the world through sin, so did sickness. We experience sickness because of the fallen world that we live in. Sometimes it's easy to see the direct causes of why somebody's ill or sick or injured. Other times we've just got no idea what the connection is. However, Jesus does say that sickness is ultimately the result of sin. Not necessarily the person's specific sin, but sin in the general sense of how it's impacted our world. Anyway, Jesus tells the man uh, that, that he's forgiven rather than telling him he is healed. And the main thing for us to remember is that God wants people forgiven and healed. Verse six, so the teachers now respond, except they don't actually respond. It's just all in their head. And, and Jesus does this strange thing in a minute where he's like, he knows what they're thinking. Maybe it's a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Maybe uh, he just knows what they're thinking. They realize only God can forgive sins. So this is one of the clearest signs Jesus is saying, I am the son of God. Verse nine, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat. This is one of those trap questions from Jesus where he answers a question that wasn't being asked with yet another question. Don't answer it, it's a trap. Neither of these are difficult for God. And he says, but I want you to know that the son of man has authority to forgive sins. So, so he says to him, I tell you, get up, take your mat and walk, and walk. So Jesus wants people to realize he has authority. Only he can forgive sins. Only he can heal diseases. He could have just as easily say to the man, be healed, but in this instance, he wants people to know he has authority to forgive sins. Again, the emphasis is on Jesus' authority. That's the main point that Mark is trying to make in this passage. He can command and sins are forgiven. He can command and sicknesses disappear. He can command and in the passages surrounding this, he can see demons leave. Mark is making the point that Jesus has all authority. Verse 12, he got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. I want you to imagine again this scene. So this crowded house, this man jumps up to his feet and then has to kind of wade his way through the crowd to, to get out. And can you imagine the, the excitement, the exuberant praise, the confusion, the what happened? Did I miss something? The, the, the people praising God and going, God is worthy. I want you though to imagine the contrast with the teachers. I imagine them still sitting there cross-armed frustrated, angry at Jesus for calling them out. And there's a, there's a really interesting dynamic. Every time God does something miraculous or powerful, it divides people into these two camps, those who worship and praise and are excited about what God's doing, and those who simply just feel too challenged to know what to do. It, interesting, miracles don't, aren't these things that automatically lead people into salvation. For some, it actually pushes them away from God. It's a really interesting thing. If we, if we just said, oh, if only we had more miracles, then more people would come to salvation. Well, Jesus did a lot of miracles, and how many people rejected him? But one of the interesting things that happens in healings and other miracles is it creates a decision point in our hearts. It creates a decision point. How are we going to respond in the moment? Is it to worship and give thanks for a man who can now walk? Or is it to take offense? And I like to think I'm obviously always the one who's worshiping God and never takes offense. But if I'm honest, sometimes it's, why did God heal that person? Why did he do it through that person? I, I know what that person's like. Why would he do it through them? 
Or, or perhaps, why is he healed that person but not me? I, I believe that actually the, the journey of discipleship is supposed to include healing and miracles because it's one of the ways God reveals our heart. Where is our heart if God heals someone next to us and not us? What will we do? So that's our, our passage today. Perhaps a familiar story, but I, I want in a moment just to highlight one verse for us. But before we do that, I just want to talk in kind of general terms about healing and salvation. For most of us in the Western church, we need to have a more holistic view on what salvation actually means. Most of us are, think, are taught to think that salvation of sins is, sorry, forgiveness of sins is what happens at salvation. But Jesus in the Gospels blurs the definition of what we call salvation time and time again. We've already looked at that connection between healing and forgiveness of sins. In our, our minds, in the Western minds, we separate those things out. We say, no, these are completely separate categories. But in biblical thought, these ideas are much closer. The word that's used most commonly in the New Testament for, for salvation is the sozo word. And the word literally means to rescue. But it has a fuller definition. The word for salvation means to save, heal, and deliver. When Jesus says he came to seek and save the lost, he meant that he came to forgive sins, to heal, and to deliver from our enemy. Salvation has a much broader sense than we often think about it. Every time we read salvation, we think only of forgiveness of sins. We are saved, and, and, and this, is, this is partly why when we talk about salvation, um, if you've put your trust in Jesus today, then, then we think of salvation as a past thing, a thing that we've done in the past. But actually, a more biblical way to think about salvation is that, is that salvation, yes, there's a moment in the past where you were saved, but there's a present experience where you're still being saved, and there will be a future experience where you will be fully saved. Salvation is actually a journey, not an event. So that's why salvation contains forgiveness of sins and healing. And anyway, that's the theology piece over with. Salvation is a broader thing than we often think about. But the main point of this passage is to put on display Jesus' authority. He has authority over sin and sickness. Neither of those are a problem for them. He just kind of brushes them aside. And when we think about healing ministry today, we need to know that we step forward not in our own authority, but in Jesus' authority. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. When you go uh, in any sense, if you go to the shops, you go to your workplace, you go to your family, you go for a walk, Every time you go, you go in the authority of Jesus. But as I was reading this passage, there was just a few words, one verse that really stood out to me. When Jesus saw their faith. Just these simple words. That Jesus recognized the faith of the friends. It was obvious to Jesus that it was faith that motivated them. I'm not saying Jesus wouldn't have healed the man without that faith, but I'm saying that Jesus notices faith. Of course, we have lots of examples in the, the Bible where faith has absolutely nothing to do with God healing or doing the miraculous. I mean, how much faith did Lazarus have? So faith, it's important you know that faith is, is not the be all and end all when it comes to uh, God working miraculously. Jesus has enough faith for everyone, okay? But faith is commented on again and again in the Gospels as one of the ingredients. I mentioned already that this, this episode today happened in Jesus' hometown in Capernaum. He may even have known the paralyzed man. He may have known the friends that brought him. And interestingly, this may even have been his house. This may have been Jesus' house. But as I was 
reading this week, I was reminded that there's another time in Mark's gospel where Jesus comes home. And just like in this example, Jesus comments on their faith. But sadly, it's not quite as positive the next time. Mark 6, verse 5, we've got it on the screen. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, a bad day for Jesus is probably a good day for the rest of us. Um, you know, he has a bad day. Only a few people got healed today. Um, we would probably take that. But Jesus comments on the fact that because of the faith in his hometown that is lacking, it prevented him in some sense from doing all the miracles he could have done. So we've got these two examples in the exact same place in Capernaum. In one instance, Jesus sees the faith of the friends. And the other one, he sees the lack of faith. And I was so struck by that contrast this week. So the question I've been left with as I've studied is simply, will Jesus see my faith? Will Jesus see my faith? Even thinking about collectively us as a community, will Jesus see our faith? When he looks in, does he see our faith? And Jesus famously said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Will I find faith on the earth? It's an interesting thing. He didn't ask, will I see everybody healed when I return? No. But he did say, will I find faith? Will I find people who put into action based on what I've said? We need to be less worried about the outcome. That's the thing that's in Jesus' hands. And more worried about the process and the actions we take personally. Do we want to be the kind of place where Jesus responds to our faith or where he remarks on our lack of faith? I've been deeply personally challenged by that this week. But first, I want to kind of clarify, what do we mean by faith? Because faith is a word that gets banded around in church all the time. And sadly, I think it gets sometimes misused or misunderstood in lots of ways. So what is faith? I've got three things up on the screen here uh, for what faith is. Simply, the most simple definition of faith is trust. To have faith is to have trust. Believing something is true and acting on it. Believing something is true and acting on it. It's not just faith if you agree with truth. If I say, like, you know, do you believe Jesus died again from, uh, he rose again from the dead? Then, and you go, yes, I believe that truth. But it's not actually faith until you act. Your life is different because of that truth. You've changed the way you live. It, so, so it's about trust. A person of deep faith is just someone who's built up trust in God's character and his nature. And they've done that by stepping out and doing things in response to God. Faith is relational, not transactional. It's not like, um, it's, it's like trust in a relationship. It grows through building trust and history with someone. Faith is also reliance, very much related to trust in a sense, but to have faith is to actually put weight on the relationship to put weight on the relationship. If you say you trust someone, but you don't ask for any help in a time of need, then you're not putting reliance on them. Your actions speak of your faith. And then finally, faith is loyalty. Biblical faith also contains this idea of faithfulness, which is why we use that phrase, faithfulness. Faithfulness is about loyalty, trust over a long period of time, not just in the moment, but when it's difficult, Am I loyal? When things are not going the way that I expected them, am I loyal? There's a stickability to faith. So what is faith not? Because I think it's helpful to say what faith isn't. Faith is not emotional excitement. It's not a buzzy, warm feeling that you get when you sense God's in the room. Our emotions fluctuate, but our faith is something deeper. Faith is also not some force. It's not like the Star Wars where uh, the force is with you. Sometimes in Christian circles, we talk about faith in ways that make us think like faith is this abstract force that's out there. And if I could just tap into this faith that's out there, then maybe God will move. We talk about atmospheres of faith, don't we? 
And that's where we get, this, we get confused about uh, faith. But faith is not an abstract force. Uh, and it's also not faith in a formula, a method, or an outcome. Sometimes we, by accident, put our faith in the way we do something. The habits we've built, the traditions, the way we've learned to pray for the sick rather than in God himself. This can be particularly true with gifts. Our, is our faith in God the healer or is it in this great way we've learned how to pray? If we say the words in Jesus' name three times in a row, uh, then it works every time. Not that we'd ever be guilty of that. But back to our question for us today. Will Jesus see our faith? Will we be known as a community that took action based on the truths he's revealed to us? Or are we prepared to just let what happens happen? Would somebody looking in see our faith by our actions? I think there's two aspects to our faith that are important when it comes to healing ministry in particular. And the first one's this, faith requires action. We actually have to do something. If the four men in our passage had stayed home, there would have been no miracle. Stepping into praying for the sick is often about obedience before it's ever about outcomes. Are we prepared to take action? To go for prayer for ourselves, to, to pray for someone else. John Wimber, who uh, was the founder of the Vineyard Movement and a man who became known for globally for having a, an amazing healing ministry, said that he prayed for a thousand people before he ever saw anyone healed. I just don't know if I've got that kind of stickability, but a thousand people, and then later becoming known as a man who, who people would fly him around the world to come and pray for the sick. Faith requires actions, and at times it is costly. Um, one of the things that happens when you go after healing is people start to learn, oh, so uh, Neil and Joe, they love to pray for the sick. So then you suddenly get calls from people who are very sick and they invite you to come and to pray for them. Um, and we were running this school of ministry and most sessions at our school of ministry, we were seeing some level of healing, um, of something happening, miraculous things happening. So people hear about this and then word kind of filters. And so I, I, get, uh, I get approached by someone saying, would you come and pray for my son? And uh, this was, I think he was a 14 or 15 year old boy uh, and his name was Jack. And, and I got invited to go and pray for Jack because Jack was dying from leukemia. And I got invited to go into what was the old sick kids hospital in town. Um, and there was all sorts of things going through my head. I'd like to tell you I was floating in on the joy of the Lord and just ready, full of faith. But I'm like, gosh, I feel like people are, they're putting their faith in me. And I've got to go and now represent God and go and pray. And I did, I had to go and I had to um, put gowns on and stuff because he was kind of, we had to protect him and make sure he was safe. Uh, and I go in and I, his mum's there and I'm praying for this young boy who um, is in his last weeks of his life. Uh, and I'm praying my best prayer and I'm like, God, would you just come and move in this hospital room? I'm like, come on God, if there was ever a time for you to move, now is the time. And I'd like to tell you that at that moment, Jack sprung out of bed and uh, the doctors were like, wow, this is amazing. I'm so glad uh, that you prayed. You must, can you pray for me as well? But no, I prayed, I blessed him. I told him about Jesus and I left. And sadly, two weeks later, I think it was two or three weeks later, he died. And this 15 year old boy died. I'm not good at encouraging you with stories today. But it's faith looks like action. We don't win every time, but faith looks like action. Are we prepared to say yes? Are we prepared to say yes? Will you pray when there is opportunity before you? I've uh, ended up praying for gas engineers, uh, Tesco delivery people, um, if you come in my house, it's fair game. Um, but you just, you find yourself in just, are you willing to take the opportunity? How many people, when you meet them, go, oh, my back is really bad today. 
And most of us just go, oh, sorry to hear that. But the challenge is, it's not appropriate in every situation. I'm not saying, and I'm not saying it as a guilt thing, but just is, there's opportunities all around us. This might sound a bit weird, but I, I, I would love to pray for your back. And you just pray. These simple acts of obedience are the faith that Jesus sees. So faith requires action and faith requires risk. God heals in all sorts of ways. And, and interestingly, if you read through the Gospels, it's actually fairly rare that he, he, he doesn't always touch people to heal them. He just says, like, be healed. And uh, there's all sorts of stories, spitting on uh, mud and eyes. And it, we go looking for formulas, don't we? But often faith is about taking a risk. If the four men carrying the paralyzed man had just showed up and went, oh well, looks like Jesus is a bit busy today. We'll maybe see if we can book an appointment for next week. No, they took a risk. Jesus could have easily have just gone, no, what are you doing? Stop destroying my roof. What are all the people gonna think? All the things that go through your head naturally, like what on earth are people gonna think if I start digging through this roof? But there's something about faith that's prepared to go a little bit further. It's gonna, it sometimes makes people look odd. It sometimes makes you stand out and, and, and there has to come a point where we're okay with that at some level. We wouldn't have had a miracle if these men hadn't taken a risk. And our trust in Jesus will sometimes lead us to do things that people are like, uh, really? There's been a number of things in my life where I've done them and people have gone, why, were you, why did you do that? Like when the Lord told us um, to move to America and study there, uh, and we had really, both had really good jobs, and they were paying us really well, and we were on this promotion scale going up here, um, and I told my boss at the time, I'm thinking about doing this thing in America, um, and they said, please don't, we'll give you a pay rise. And I said, no thanks, I'm going. A lot of my friends were like, what are you doing? Faith sometimes makes us look a bit stupid <laughs> in the world's eyes. But as I say, Jesus often doesn't heal in all the exact same ways that we expect. Um, it's just some stories from NBCF for us. Um, God works through our online services. I don't know if you knew that. God has a, a wonderful habit of working through our online services. Last time I spoke about healing, uh, we were still in some form of lockdown. I can't remember which one it was. It's all a blur now. But we were meeting online, and uh, I spoke about healing. And at the end of the message, uh, all, this is me speaking to a camera in my office, like no great atmosphere, no time of worship. I'm like, I feel like God might want to heal someone who's got pain on the left-hand side of their neck. And uh, just threw it out there. Didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. Later that week, one of our regulars uh, got in touch to say they, they'd been away on the Sunday, hadn't seen it, and they, they caught up on the Wednesday. But they woke up on the Wednesday with pain in the left-hand side of their neck. Sat down on the Wednesday, oh, I should catch up with church, shouldn't I? Sat down, watched the church service, and as I called out this word of knowledge, the pain in the left-hand side of their neck just disappeared. Sometimes we pray for people over email. We've, we've, we, like sometimes like we have people who have followed us online and we, we pray for them over email. And somebody got in touch who needed prayer for their wrist. It was suspected their wrist was broken. Just wrote down the words, Father, I just pray that you would heal such and such, blah, 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 blah. Amen. Send. A few days later, I get a, a message back saying, my wrist feels better. Thanks. So God is on the move, and he works through online services as well. Uh, our very, very first day ever of our school of ministry back in 2013, I think it was, um, and we had done nothing, but we just welcomed some students. We had, I think it was 37 students in the room, and we said, we're going to have a time of worship before we do any, uh, anything else, just time of worship. Uh, and so we just sung a th songs for about half an hour or so, had a time of worship, and then I think it was Joe just had the boldness to say, as we were worshiping, did anyone notice any improvement in their body? Yeah, we hadn't mentioned the word healing. We hadn't done any of that. And somebody goes, yeah, actually. 
uh, during the worship time, I had my hands up praising God. And um, I forget the exact syndrome, but it was something to do with mobility in, in her wrist. She wasn't able to do anything strong with her wrist. She couldn't hoover, couldn't do any of that stuff. And as she was worshiping, she felt like her fingers were being pulled. And then all the pain was gone. And this lady was just up in worship and, and, and just praising God. And all the pain had just completely gone. But all it took was Joe's faith to say, wait a minute, God might have done something and he doesn't need my permission to do it. This is the good thing about it. Some of you might be sitting in here today and you might be like, oh, that pain I came in with, I appear to have left it at church today. God is on the move. Another story just to kind of break your brain slightly when it comes to healing ministry. Uh, we, Joe and I were on, uh, invited as part of a team to go and do some ministry at a church in the Czech Republic. And uh, we were there for the whole week and uh, it was all through translators and we we're trying to figure out how to do this ministry and we're preaching and we're sharing. But one of the, one of the times during ministry, um, I can't remember which one of us it was, but we, we just felt like rather than pray for people, we were just going to count down from 10 and ask God to heal people in the room. So we just did that. It's, it's, it's like a bit childlike, I know. It's a bit childish. You know, maybe I'm not taking this God seriously enough. But we count down from 10, and three or four people in the room are suddenly healed. Now, I, again, that's not a formula. I'm not saying that every time we do that, God's going to move. But what does he see in that moment? He sees faith. He sees someone who's willing to trust that God can do that. It's not difficult for him. I'm trying to decide if I share some more stories. No, I better wrap it up. <laughs> Save some for next time. But these seem like silly examples. These seem like just out the box thinking in terms of how God moves. But I believe that fundamentally faith is about our action and it's about us being willing to take risks at times. What is faith for you today? Maybe faith for you today is just being willing to be prayed for. Maybe it's because you've already been prayed for a thousand times before. Maybe it's a thousand and one that God wants to do it. Maybe risk for you is praying for someone else for the first time this week. Maybe you've never prayed for anyone. And, and, and your, your faith this week is, is just nudging someone in church and saying, could I pray for you? Is it next time we're in worship just sticking your hands up in prayer and just saying, God, heal me now? What is faith for you? And the good news is the Bible says you, faith isn't something you have to kind of muster up. It's like, it, it, muster, I'm going to say, the mustard seed. <laughs> Faith just needs to be the tiniest little thing that goes, oh, God's real. What does he want to do today? We don't have to have huge faith. We just need to trust him. Take action, take risk. Let God see your faith. So today we are, we're going to pray again at the end. Um, we're going to have a time to pray. And so if there's something you want prayer for, then I just encourage you, to come up. I'm going to hand back over to Jo um, and then we're going to sing a final song and she'll explain what we're doing.